Hello, welcome to today's webinar for the Law Awareness Week at CDC 2020, The Law and Me, Stronger Together, organized by the Law Society Pro Bono Services and the five Community Development Councils and supported by People's Association, National University of Singapore Faculty of Law, Singapore Management University School of Law, Singapore University of Social Sciences, and the Singapore Corporate Council Association. My name is Sarita Misser, and I will be your host for today's webinar on employment, termination, and retrenchment. Just some housekeeping notes before we get started. Relevant materials for today's talk can be downloaded from the handout section, which you can see on your screen. If you are using a mobile phone or tablet, the icon should appear on your top right-hand corner. On your computer, you should see the icon on the right. Please download these useful materials before the end of today's talk. Feel free to ask any question during the webinar. You can, you can type your questions into the question section and click send. Your questions will only be seen by the organizer. We will do our best to address your questions during the talk or at the end of the talk. Please note that the discussion and any material provided in this webinar is not intended to substitute for or constitute as professional legal advice, you should always consult a lawyer if you require specific legal advice. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get into the discussion. On our panel today, we have Patrick Tay and Francis Goh. Patrick is the Assistant Secretary General of NTUC and also Director of NTUC's Legal Services and Strategy. Concurrently, he's an elected Member of Parliament and the NTUC Central Committee. He chairs the Government Parliamentary Committee for Education and is a member of the Government Parliamentary Committee for Law and Home Affairs. He has been representing the labour movement in all the tripartite work groups to review and update employment and industrial relations legislation. Francis is a mediator, legal advisor and partner at Harry Elias Partnership. He has nearly 30 years of experience in dispute resolution. He believes that with proper advice, Parties can manage disputes and do business with confidence. He also advises clients on LPA, uh, which is lasting power of attorney, wills and probate. He serves on the Council of the Singapore Institute of Arbitrators as the Honorary Secretary and is the Senior Advocacy Trainer for the Law Society of Singapore. He regularly volunteers with the Law Society Pro Bono Services. Patrick Francis, thank you both for joining us this evening. Hi, very good evening, Hi. everyone. Hi, good evening. Thank you. So moving to our discussion. Patrick, the current COVID-19 situation has seen a lot of businesses being adversely affected. And concurrently, we can see employees or workers as well being affected uh, with uh, a, a lot in the news about retrenchments right, and layoffs. Um, in fact, actually, the, the Ministry of Manpower's labor market report for second quarter of 2020 that was released about a month back, I think said that the total employment in Singapore fell to its sharpest on record in the first half of the year. And the numbers for unemployment and retrenchment are expected to in fact increase in the second half that we're in right now. Can you give us a flavor of what's going on in the market right now? Hi, uh, thanks Rita and a very good evening to everyone tuning in. Uh, essentially, uh, what we are seeing in the first half uh, we have been seeing the effects of a COVID-19 pandemic and its effects on businesses and companies across the board. I don't think it's just Singapore alone. I think the region and every, every part of the world, every country in the world is uh, facing exacting challenges, particularly on the economic front. And of course, uh, with a lot of travel restrictions and uh, a lot of uh, other restrictions, including safe management measures, it has resulted in certain industries more deeply affected. For example, aviation, aerospace, even tourism sector, as well as hospitality. These are some of the sectors that have been quite hard hit. As you can see, uh, through the various rounds of budget, we've been trying to support some of these sectors, including some of the announcements that happened uh, just two days ago. I think uh, you'll see, see, continue to see that because I think air travel is still not open uh, or completely open or as business as usual. Uh, and therefore, these sectors will still feel the brunt of uh, many of the impact and challenges. But at the same time, also, uh, just out, as you've alluded to, the uh, second quarter labor market report, uh, starting about three weeks ago. Uh, and what we're seeing is that uh, just the first half alone, the first half of 2020 alone, we're seeing something like slightly more than 11,000 uh, retrenchments uh, that have happened. And uh, mind you, that's uh, 
more than the entire of 2019. Uh, 2019 is something like 10,008. Uh, now, uh, just the first half alone, something like 11,300. So the numbers are not looking good. Um, and, and mind you, the first quarter we, wasn't as bad as the second quarter. Second quarter became worse. I think partly also fueled by the fact that we had uh, two months of circuit breaker. Uh, but what we are seeing, of, of course, uh, we're watching for the third quarter and fourth quarter figures as well. Something which we need to pay very close attention to for several reasons. I think firstly, the full impact of the COVID-19, I mean, there's a bit of a time lag, but you will feel the effects of it. Likewise, in the first half of the year, we are seeing a lot of businesses, companies and businesses, including micro SMEs, startups and SMEs being affected and some even going to liquidation and bankruptcy. So I think uh, we are starting to see from that is a good proxy or indicator that some businesses are going under and, uh, and, and feeling um, the, the challenges of uh, this entire uh, pandemic. Uh, likewise, also, uh, you know, second half of the year, uh, some of the support schemes are gradually tapering down. Uh, including a job support scheme, except for, of course, the deeply affected sector. So uh, we, we hope through these various interventions and subvention by the government uh, will help uh, fuel and power the economy. At the same time, also, you have heard uh, Minister Gan Kim Yong as well, the multi-ministerial task force sharing on how we are going to gradually open up the economy because I think there's a direct correlation on how fast we open and how fast things get back on track. And uh, I don't think we will get business as usual so fast, so quick. But I think uh, it's important for all of us to be able to navigate, I wouldn't say the new next uh, new normal, I'll call it the next normal, and, and how we're going to uh, manage all these various uh, management, safe management measures in, in the workplaces and it costs all premises. So mm -hmm. the second half of the year, my forecast is that uh, you will see some of the, the figures uh, that have been reported in the public media, for example, that the layoffs in, uh, uh, in, in SIA, uh, the layoffs in uh, some of our, our establishments such as Resorts World, Suntech, etc. Some big names. So I think that will add up to the figures for the third quarter. So I, 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 I'm not optimistic about the third quarter. In fact, just earlier today, uh, while Minister Manpower was just giving an update, uh, now there's a regular weekly update on the job situation. Just uh, six hours ago, she was just sharing that the unemployment has crept up. Uh, you know, it has crept up. And, uh, and, and, and looking at it, uh, uh, we were taking a reference on the global financial crisis in 2009, uh, we're not doing anything better. So, so that's the figures, uh, at least for now. And then therefore, my forecast is the next two quarters, we need to play a close watch. I think the retrenchment numbers are going to pick up, uh, increase, uh, coupled by the fact that, uh, uh, as you, you shared earlier, emp total employment numbers have dropped very sharply in, in the first half and the second quarter. So that's another worrying sign. And, and, and finally, of course, the unemployment numbers. Uh, uh, again, all, all, all these figures point towards the fact that they will have a very uh, softening of the labour market uh, for the second half of this year and beyond. Thank you, Patrick. That's actually quite, uh, quite concerning news, I have to say. Um, moving on, Francis, what about yourself? In your role as a mediator and legal advisor, have you seen a difference in terms of your uh, clients approaching you in terms of the kind of employment law advice that they have that they want to get right now versus what they you know previously actually were asking for uh thanks arita you know the numbers that uh patrick was sharing uh actually correlates very well with the anecdotal evidence that i have to share uh just pre-covid everyone was bullish people were inquiring about hiring about expansion about anticipating future demand then when COVID hit, uh, you know, it was like pulling a handbrake. Uh, I think it's safe to say we are in the middle of the COVID storm right now. And the thing here is that everybody is hurting. It's not just employees or one particular sector. We are seeing concerns from employers and employees alike. Let us, me just give you two examples. Just uh, two days ago, I was speaking with, uh, you know, a SME employer who was saying, how am I going to keep my company afloat? Uh, I have got $400,000 worth of projects owed by several companies. Without that, I don't have the cash flow to keep my company afloat. He has, in the meantime, paid all his downstream suppliers because he felt a sense of obligation. But now when his own suppliers are not paying him, he's caught in between. 
with a cash crunch. And his employees are, you know, rallying behind, taking pay cuts, uh, taking retraining, reskilling. But he was asking me, when will this end? And the answer is that nobody really knows. And then on the other hand, we're getting a lot of uh, concerned individuals who are coming to us and saying, my employer is doing this, I'm not getting transparency, there's lack of communication, I worry about my employment, my status, and some people say, I've just been laid off, what are my rights? So mm. I think that uh, this, this uh, session now is timely, and I hope that together, you know, we would be able to give some light and encouragement to our listeners. Thank you, Patrick, that's very encouraging, and I think that's really our aim uh, for this session as well. So let's maybe move on to um, the fact that, you know, we've seen a lot of advisories, you know, being issued by the tripartite partners uh, and MOM that relate to excess manpower and uh, retrenchments, right? Uh, reducing manpower costs in a responsible manner. Um, the chief amongst all this would be the tripartite advisory on managing excess manpower and responsible retrenchment. NTC has also recently introduced the fair retrenchment framework in August. Patrick, can you just explain the public policy uh, reasoning behind why the tripartite partners and NQC have decided to release these advisories to guide employers and workers during this time? Yeah, uh, there's, there's been a slew of uh, or a plethora of advisories issued by Ministry of Manpower as well as the uh, tripartite partners. But I think it's good to focus our minds on a, a few important pieces. I think firstly, of course, it's, a, it's as you alluded to earlier, the tripartite uh, uh, advisory on managing excess manpower responsible retrenchment, a very, very important piece of uh, uh, advisory. Uh, why do I say that? Because that was actually issued uh, uh, exactly uh, immediately after uh, the global financial, uh, when the global financial st crisis started. I remember very vividly because the, the, the first pronouncement of it was sometime in December 2008. And then uh, we had a, a, a kind of like an updated version in uh, 2009. So that was actually the first manifestation of this tripartite advisory on managing excess manpower and subsequently including responsible retrenchment. So that advisory has been enforced or should I say have been relevant. Uh, of course, we had many good years. And of course, particularly now, uh, uh, exacerbated by what's happening because of COVID-19, this advisory has taken a new turn and new relevance. And, uh, and, and to augment that, uh, although it's uh, quite a comprehensive piece of uh, adv advisory to outline some of the measures and steps to take. Uh, I think one key principle we take from that advisory is you know, using retrenchment as a last resort. But other than that, there are sort of various interventions, ways to, to guide companies and businesses to embark on before they take that final option. And of course, uh, two other important uh, advisories that came, came up, uh, besides one that, that relates to salary and, uh, and, and leave uh, uh, in, in response to COVID-19, uh, very important is also the, the one on payment or retrenchment benefits. Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, uh, this MOM advisory on payment, which I think is a copy available for everyone to to take a to download and have a look at it. Uh, it's important because we kind of like, uh, the advisory applies to companies and businesses to guide them, uh, especially when they want to do uh, major steps uh, when uh, laying off people, uh, retrenching people, and of course uh, uh, taking some guide or some uh, advice into how to do it uh, correctly, fairly, and responsibly. And finally, as you as you shared earlier on uh, NTUC and the labor movement coming up with the Fair Retrenchment Framework, FRF uh, for short, I think this is something we feel very passionate about because as we see um, the number of layoffs and retrenchments picking up in the last, uh, particularly uh, at the start of Circuit Breaker and then subsequently in the, in the subsequent months, uh, right up to now today, I think uh, because of the cases we are seeing uh, and, and we, of course, in a unionized environment, we, are, we work very closely the management and to, to make sure there's proper communication, that there's open and transparent sharing of uh, the current performance of the company and what's uh, uh, upfront and what's the forecast. Uh, not all companies uh, behave like that. I think there are employers and businesses uh, who, who uh, may be smaller, who may be not in a, mostly in a non-unionized environment, uh, may not know the, the right way or the, the most judicious way of carrying out some of these. Or should I say, not the, the most fair, responsible, and progressive way of doing it. Uh, so therefore, uh, that that the fair retention framework is to uh, serve as a guide to companies and businesses, uh, particularly employers, in to doing it fairly. Why do I say it fairly? Because I think in the in the choice of workers, in the in 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 how it's uh it's being carried out, 
whether it's sensitively uh, and whether it's proper communication. I think these are all covered in this fair retrenchment framework, which uh, the, the labor movement has promulgated and which we have lobbied for the government and tripartite partners to adopt. And I'm glad to share that uh, uh, the government and in particular Ministry of Manpower and tripartite partners have come forward and agreed and supported that we, uh, we include this in, in some form uh, moving ahead. Patrick, also then on this point, um, you know, since you're very close to the labor movement, I know the tripartite advisory on managing excess manpower has a few different kind of, uh, you know, um, guidances or a different kind of steps that companies can take before they go to the last resort of retrenchment. Can you give us a flavor of what you've seen out there being most commonly used in the market by employers? Yes. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Sarita, for that question. Of course, they are in, in that advisory, there are like five, six, five to six, uh, or should I say seven measures that are being fleshed out. But we may, may highlight uh, what's uh, happening on the ground. In fact, it started all from uh, uh, just after Chinese New Year. I think when uh, the travel ban started and, and there's a, uh, and then of course the circuit breaker, I think a lot of companies and businesses were, were pushed to the edge, literally, particularly those who uh, with cash flow problems, particularly those who had uh, really no business i mean really downtime totally uh, no manufacturing no production so so quite a lot are impacted so there were uh, if you all recall uh, there were four rounds of budgets uh, right from uh, the start of the very first budget in february and subsequently three other rounds and of course as recent as two days ago you heard about so called the fifth budget uh, to 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 help companies and businesses so in uh, all these budget announcements there were actually quite a lot of subvention subsidy and uh, uh, should I say support measures uh, that were rolled out. So these uh, point to what's, uh, and, and this correlate directly to the, the tripartite advisory and, and some of these measures that are recommended. For example, training. So training subsidy has been beefed up, ramped up and, uh, at, at the company level, at the individual level, at the national level, through Skills Future and many other, other initiatives. And, and companies actually uh, uh, have been uh, advised, or in fact, I see companies uh, doing very aggressively, sending their workers for training uh, during the downtime. So uh, I, I'm glad to share that there are actually quite quite a number of companies, including very large companies, who have sent their staff because of the downtime, no production, no travel, uh, to take on uh, training. And uh, of course, there's absentee payroll being funded by government to the company. So that helps to defray some of the costs, the manpower costs as well. So training is uh, one example. Of course, another an example will be redeployment. Yeah, redeployment uh, because maybe perhaps certain parts of the business, maybe front facing is not doing that well because you close up your retail outfits. So therefore, some of those workers have been redeployed to the middle office or back office to handle some of the work that can be done either remotely or even virtually. So that's another example. Of course, uh, we have also uh, took a few other examples such as clearing of annual leave uh, and, and taking of some no pay leave. So these are also additional measures because as I alluded to earlier, uh, the, the key rules of engagement is we try to use retrenchment as a last resort or final option. So in between that, we try to use all the various cost-saving measures. Because I mean, the mantra is that, you know, we let's cut costs to save jobs, not cut jobs to save costs. Yeah. So we find various ways. I mean, training, redeployment, consuming of annual leave, uh, even no pay leave. Uh, like, like, like in, in, for example, I mean, uh, we all know in, in SIA, uh, and of course, some of the other uh, companies, uh, large companies where there's no travel and aviation and aerospace, they have already taken to doing, uh, uh, companies have even you know, allowed them to take on the second job, uh, i.e. Uh, FCA distant ambassadors, healthcare ambassadors, even transport ambassadors. So you do see some of these cabin crew uh, at some of our public uh, infrastructure and facilities as well. So, so these are some uh, of the measures. And of course, uh, uh, one other measure I need to, uh, to mention is in Singapore, we have a flexible wage system. So we do have companies and businesses taking wage cuts as well. Uh, but that's why the, the government had to step in uh, through the COVID support grant to help uh, uh, workers in particular who have taken uh, deeper wage cuts, 30% or more, or even laid off uh, with some form of support grant to tide them over the difficult period. So these are but uh, some of the measures uh, that are mentioned in the advisory and on the ground uh, till today happening. Thank you, Patrick. Francis. Can you let us know then, from a lawyer's perspective, what is the legal effect of the advisories? Is it mandatory that employers have to follow the advisory? And what if they don't? Are there any implications? Okay, thank you, uh, Sarita. That's a great question. 
uh, I think uh, for our listeners, let's take a quick, uh, you know, recap of the labour situation in Singapore. Uh, we exist in a rather interesting society. The uh, legislation has chosen to take what we call a light touch in the sense that there is very little uh, uh, entrenchment of uh, employment rights. It's left pretty much to a negotiation between employer and employee and it's encapsulated in your employment contract. All right. But we also have this tripartite uh, relationship where, you know, private sector, government sector, you know, together with labor movement. And the labor movement is not just for unionized employees. I think uh, the labor movement over the years has grown to be the voice of employees at all levels. And now in a crisis like this, that tripartite alliance is being tested and I think we are seeing the value of it. So to answer your point directly, the tripartite advisories actually set out the rules of fair play, in a sense, it enables employers and employees to have that dialogue on a level playing field because there is a third party that's saying this is how you should approach retrenchment or difficult conversations about laying off employees. These are best practices about what you should do. All right. Now, what prevails is still your contract, but these tripartite advisories are shall we say, things that they would follow and there would have to be good explanation as to why you are not following or why you are departing from this established standard. Uh, it has yet to be, I think, definitively proven in court as to whether the tripartite advisory is going to be enforced. But what we do see is that uh, Ministry of Manpower are actually taking a firm stand whereby if there are complaints by employees, if there are news about employers flouting these rules, I think MOM takes a very uh, you know, strong stance on it. And where necessary, they are uh, not shy to impose administrative penalties. All right, this is on a case by case basis, but certainly I think to those who are hurting out there, whether your employers or employees, just know that these rules of engagement are not just there for show, all right? They are being followed as best as possible by people on the ground. But of course, um, you know, there can't be a one size fits all. And uh, the nature of the current uh, crisis that we're facing is that there will be people uh, who will feel hurt. And that is why they need to understand their rights. All right, back to you, Sarita. Thank you, Francis. Thank you for explaining that at least there's some teeth by right, some implications if, uh, if people don't you know, refuse to follow or don't want to follow. Let's move on then to another important topic, uh, which is about termination of employment. Um, you know, with, with all these news reports and the advisories that you were just explaining about the guidelines being released, uh, you know, on employment termination and retrenchment at the moment, um, what is the view, uh, Patrick and Francis, what's the view that you have about whether this means that there's a new normal, right, to use a very overused kind of term, but does it mean that there's a new employment, uh, uh, sorry, new, new normal when it comes to looking at termination for employment versus what it was before? Has the law changed in any way? You know, Patrick, let me jump in on this since she says, has the law changed, okay? <laughs> uh, I think the law has not changed. All right, so let me explain what was the law or what is the law. The law is your contract terms prevail. All right, and in terms of termination, the contract allows either party to terminate with a certain period of notice or in certain circumstances without notice. So that forms your baseline. All right, so in a sense, if an employer wants to terminate you, the first thing they would do is look at your contract. It says one month's notice of termination or pay in lieu thereof. That is the typical, usual, standard type of termination clause. And so the employer then decides, I pay you one month's worth of salary. I can get you to leave immediately. Of course, I pay all the other contractual benefits as well. 
or I let you serve out your one month notice period, you still get your pay and you leave 30 days later or 31 days later, whatever that calendar month is. All right. So that forms the baseline of what termination has been. Then you say, why like that? Now, in the good times, this was something that was viewed as a strength. If you were an employee in the good times and you wanted to leave your to get to a better paying job, you would want your notice period to be as short as possible. Mm -hmm. All right. But now the tables are turned. Mm -hmm. All right. When the things are not so great, then you're concerned about where is my next pay, where is my next job. So we're looking now at security. Now, from the employer's point of view, all right, that kind of flexibility in the employment legislation and contract is good because I get the ability to ramp up quickly because I can get manpower from wherever if things are rosy and good. Or on the other hand, if I needed to kind of rejig for productivity or you know reorientation of my business i can also easily hive off staff and by and large in a thriving world economy and local economy that was never an issue you can mm. always find another job all right things are different now so is there a new normal i would say there is all right because with the tripartite advisories and all the hard work of the labor movement what we're really seeing is employers do take to heart responsible retrenchment. I know that to the aggrieved employee on the ground, it will never feel like, you know, that uh, you know, it's why me, all right? Mm -hmm. But uh, for the employers, I do know that they are making every effort to uh, do this. And on those where they are not doing it, I am seeing clients, uh, employees coming to me who are not hesitating to blow the whistle, you know, and uh, take the employers to task. So I would say that while the law hasn't changed, contract is still prevalent, but I think you see parties trying to do the right thing, trying to have that difficult conversation. And so in a sense, this uh, crisis has given rise to a new normal. All right, but that's the view from a lawyer. Patrick, what about you? What do you see on the ground? Yeah, so so I think termination of employment uh, as uh, what Francis mentioned earlier. I mean, there's no change in the the, the law, the legal basis behind it. I mean, it's it's, a, it's just as in any other co employment contract or contract principles still apply. So there's no change in the law. However, a, a, as we know, I mean, uh, the series of advisories and how we're going to manage this entire COVID-19 and its effects uh, is something which uh, uh, which is very very important. That's why uh, many many advisories, uh, in fact. Uh, Coming up will be at the National Wages Council guidelines. You probably heard about it. I think uh, the the it has been the group has been convened again. I mean, usually there's only once a year, but uh, the group has convened again, and so looking at examining it, uh, uh, whether what uh, a set of new recommendations that come out uh, publicly to 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 guide uh, companies and businesses uh, looking at what's happening moving ahead. As I've shared earlier about the forecast. So so in terms of termination of employment, uh, the law doesn't change. However, uh, I think I think what two important points I would like to uh, add on here. Firstly, of course, uh, whether it's a unionized and non-unionized environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, in general principles, the employment contract prevails. However, in 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 some of the unionized environment where there's a collective agreement, uh, that's mm -hmm. where uh, our union leaders, uh, including myself, uh, being in the labor movement, and some of us uh, get involved in it uh, to make sure we we. Uh, Things are not just in compliance uh, with the employment contract, but also in compliance with what is set out in the collective agreement. So that's an additional document for uh, exclusively, uh, should I say, for the benefit of union members and uh, those in the unionized environment. But uh, the other point I wanted to just make also, it's uh, I think that the, the, should I say, the trickiness comes uh, uh, about, uh, not because of the termination, but uh, when two other situations, uh, when uh, which I, I hope we'll touch on shortly after this, on whether it's a disguised retrenchment. But of course, the other one is, of course, uh, whether it's the, the whole termination or the whole uh, ending of the contract is done in a very wrongful or unfair way. So that's mm. where, uh, where, where, you know, this is, we now have set up the Tripartite Alliance for Disputes Management, uh, which will cover all employees, of course, with some jurisdictional cap, uh, but other or claims cap. But otherwise, that's one platform which, uh, if if uh, 
if you do find that you, you are one of the aggrieved uh, employees, uh, then that's one channel which you can uh, go to. I mean, of course, uh, we won't go into the, the exacting details of uh, the Tripartite Alliance for Dispute Management as well as the Employment Claims Tribunal. I think uh, you can log on to our previous or other uh, webinars. But at the same time, also, uh, there's a very, very comprehensive uh, web page on this. Uh, this is easily uh, available through Google to get a better understanding of the workings of the TADM as well as the ECT, i.e. the Tripartite Alliance for Dispute Management and the Employment Claims Tribunal for short. So but that's another uh, route uh, where uh, just uh, last year we've availed to uh, all employees and of course uh, now extended to a case of uh, a wrongful unfair dismissal. Thank you, Patrick. Francis, I think we have a, a very good background. So why don't we just move into our first scenario. Um, our first scenario for this evening simulates a real life situation that an employee might find themselves in. So the scenario is that John is an employee working in the IT department of a bank. He has been working there for the past three years. He has just been informed that his employment will be terminated. He was not given a reason for the termination. And obviously he's upset because he believes he's been a good employee. He's heard that three other colleagues in his department are also being let go. He's wondering whether his termination is actually a disguised retrenchment. He did not receive any retrenchment benefits and nor any job finding support or assistance. So maybe I think first things first, right? Let's, let's move into whether or not this is actually considered a retrenchment in the first place, right? Um, uh, Patrick, Francis, can you, can you give us a, a flavor of, um, you know, legally speaking, what is the difference between a termination by notice versus a retrenchment? Is there even a definition of retrenchment under the law? Has okay. MON given any clarity? All right. Uh, Patrick, let me jump in on this first. Okay. Uh, right. Let's, there are two big terms uh, that jump out at the listeners now. Termination and then something called retrenchment. Now, termination is the bringing and end of the employment relationship on any ground, usually based on the contractual terms, whether with notice or without notice. All right, so that's termination. Now, you would think of then uh, termination, it can be for poor performance, it can be for, you know, uh, any other kind of reason and it would include a retrenchment situation, all right? But now there has been some clarity uh, in the various uh, you know, guidelines and the rule of thumb is basically this. If a termination of an employee is without a view of trying to then replace the person's role at any point of time in the future, then there is a presumption that a retrenchment has taken place, all right? And then the onus would be on the employer to then justify and show that they have followed all of the guidelines, you know, and uh, basically ensured that the employee's welfare in these circumstances have been taken uh, care of as best as possible. So applying that to our current scenario here, if there has been a termination, if there are several other employees also being terminated, there doesn't appear to be on the face of it that they are going to be replaced anytime soon. They haven't been paid retrenchment benefits. So it would appear that this termination is actually a retrenchment situation. And in the current scenario where there are prevailing guidelines of best practices, then I think the employer will have some explaining to do. All right, Patrick, what do you think? Yes, if I may chime in. I think, uh, unfortunately, there's no statutory definition of retrenchment in Singapore. Uh, but uh, like what Francis uh, rightly pointed out, there are advisories and the various guidelines do allude and do provide some clarity to what uh, is tantamount to retrenchment. So in, in, a, in a very simplest way, it's uh, it's a like what Francis mentioned, a termination of con uh, employment contract, but uh, usually it's because of redundancy. I think the key word for me, it will be redundancy. If it's a situation of redundancy, then uh, therefore uh, it's, it's, it will be classified as a retrenchment. So uh, 
so so that's the 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 that, that's how we extrapolate or should I say uh, extricate the meaning of retrenchment, meaning there's a termination, but because of redundancy. So that's one. Uh, when it comes to payment of retrenchment benefits, actually there are there are uh, two areas. I mean, two two uh, whether you're unionized or non-unionized, there are two routes or should I say two uh, uh, reference points. Uh, firstly, uh, if you are in a uh, in a unionized environment, almost all the time there will be a collect uh, collective agreement, and a collective agreement do provide uh, either through a formula or through some uh, explicit way or through some negotiable way mentioned about the payment or retrenchment benefits. So that's something for the parties to negotiate, i.e. the union and the, uh, the, uh, the union members uh, as well as the, the management and employer. So that's a, a unionized environment. In a non-unionized environment, then the question that we get is, so, so how much should I get paid? Uh, so as what uh, Francis alluded to earlier, it, it's going to be whatever that is stated in your employment contract. Uh, in, in some cases, they mentioned, they call it severance payments. In some cases, they call it a golden handshake. I mean, a different nomenclature for, for the different kind of payments. Uh, but however, the tripartite uh, uh, advisory on managing assessment power and responsible retrenchment do allude and do mention uh, to a certain extent uh, it, uh, the amount of retrenchment benefits that are payable uh, based on sort of uh, market practice or industry kind of, uh, send, uh, 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 proxy. So in the unionized environment, it's always a month per year of service. And in a, in a non-unionized environment, it's about two weeks uh, per month of service. Uh, but again, dependent on the industry. Yeah, I, I have cases where I, I, I have uh, brought cases before the industrial arbitration court on behalf of workers and unionized companies and the unions uh, with respect to the payment of retention benefits. And I've also referred to some of these guidelines. So I think, uh, in well, not not, uh, uh, or state courts, but essentially the industrial arbitration court did uh, say in a very clear and, 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 and unequivocal manner that uh, the industry practice does play a very big role in ascertaining. At the same time, also the company's ability to pay. I think at the same time, uh, this is a very important fact that uh, we need to take cognizance of. Uh, no point us proclaiming that you know you 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 you. Uh, you get a judgment or, or you, you are very clear that you know it's one month per year of service but at the end of the day the company uh, financials are not good in fact they are in the red uh, they, they can't even survive the next month less to say pay some of these so I think I think that the challenge uh, moving ahead particularly this COVID-19 pandemic situation it's uh, that's why the advisory on on uh, the second advisory uh, that I alluded to on the payment of recession benefits came out uh, also because of this very reason that some companies are really uh, down and out and really in the red. So, so uh, to even be able to pay research benefits is a big question mark as well. So even if you hold them to court or even to the industrial arbitration court, if they are totally unable to pay based on their books, and if it's a, a genuine case of inability to pay, uh, then, then uh, uh, you, you may face a bit of obstacles there. But if you are able to prove that company is able to pay or in fact doing well, and then there's a redundant situation then, uh, the advice you will take precedence. Mm. Let me jump back in there uh, and, and just say two things. For any employee, since this scenario is about an employee who feels that you may be aggrieved, there are two immediate things that you could do. Uh, Patrick alluded to this earlier, the TADM. I just need you to take note that there is a one month uh, from the day, your last day of employment, you need to make your notification with the TADM within that one month. So if you are contemplating uh, to whether or not to, you know, have a, a legal route uh, for your grievance, then don't delay too long. The other aspect is if you feel that uh, you are somehow being shortchanged or aggrieved, uh, you can always go to the MOM website, all right, and uh, reach out for guidance there as well. All right. Now, what happens then is this for a retrenched worker all right you basically look at three things what is your employment contract how what rights are enshrined in there all right so for example if you have a severance package you should be due to have your severance package if there are certain uh, months of termination uh, or pay in due you should get that then look at the tripartite advisory. There are some very good websites and write-ups there about what those guidelines are. Compare that against what is your contractual right. 
see whether that is something that the employer should take into account. All right. And then, of course, you have to look at your company scenario. Uh, as Patrick was alluding to, if your company is really, really going down, then, you know, it, it's, it's likely to be a genuine distress situation. But if you feel for any reason that you are aggrieved because the company may, you know, not be giving you the correct picture, then consider the TADM route or the MOM uh, guidance uh, so that you would get uh, some uh, help to deal with your specific circumstances. Right, thanks. Back to you, Sarita. Thank you, Patrick Francis. I think on this note as well, um, yesterday there was, uh, I think, Minister Josephine Teo, uh, the Minister of Manpower, I think in Parliament, you know, there, there was a question one of the MPs actually posed to her, which was that, uh, you know, the uh, on the issue of retrenchment benefits, right? Um, because uh, it's, it looks like, uh, you know, the, the legal position is that um, there is no outright legal entitlement to getting retrenchment benefits. However, guidance can be taken, number one, from your, obviously, the employment contract, and then number two, from the tripartite advisory on payment of retrenchment benefits, right? Um, that was an interesting question posed by one of the MPs, which was that about, you know, why doesn't the government just legislate a minimum level of retrenchment benefits anyway? Why is it that we need to have the non-binding sort of um, uh, tripartite advisory that that you know employers may or may not you know want to follow uh, in terms of the calculation? Why can't we just legislate it? Why why doesn't the government do that? Patrick Patrick, maybe can you give your view? You know, sitting as an MP yourself, right, and as yeah. a labor union leader on this point. Yeah, I think this point has been uh, uh, discussed, and uh, I've also uh, brought this at the tripartite discussions maybe you were. Uh, uh, deliberating on the various rounds. Uh, I, re I recall very vividly the first round of uh, Employment Act amendments when it took effect in 2014 and subsequently when the second round, the latest round that took effect in 2019. I think this is a, is a, is a is, is something where the tripartite level we are we are in deep negotiations and deep discussions about even prior to COVID-19. Whether should we make it mandatory? Because of course uh, there's a risk uh, when you put it mandatory, whatever amount you set, whether it's one week, two weeks, three weeks, one month, I mean uh, in, in, in any circumstance, that would, shall, might, might well be the default setting for all companies and businesses. Because mind you, the current framework is such that uh, in our unionized companies, we actually uh, imbue some of these uh, the amount of retention benefits payable in the collective agreement. Mm -hmm. So uh, of course, one tip to everyone is to join as a union member, unionize a company, and then, uh, well, you, you get that locked in for life. Lah. Uh, or until such time the negotiations happen and, and, and otherwise. So so that's uh, my my often pet peeve when I go out to evangelize on getting people on board unions and being a union member, because at least during this downtime, uh, particularly uh, during this downtime, at least some of these interests and welfare are safeguarded uh, in, in a legal manner. Because uh, say all you want, the collective agreement is an award of court. Uh, I, I've instances where I had to bring this up uh, where, where you know uh, parties uh, or, or the employer failed to pay. So I remember bringing one of these employers uh, to the Industrial Arbitration Court as well. So I think, mm -hmm. I think that is uh, one security. Uh, the other aspect is, of course, uh, as I alluded to earlier, for people who are in a non-unionized, uh, non-union member situation, uh, then in a way, besides your employment contract, uh, there are other, oh, there are, well, you alluded to the other recourse is through the tripartite advisory and through the TADM. So that, that gives you an indication that uh, where possible, uh, where the company is still a going concern and still profitable, uh, do try to, uh, from an industry practice kind of level, uh, give some form of severance payment. So, so in a way, it's moral solution uh, because it's not pro it, it may not have been provided in employment contract. So it's more like a, a moral solution and sort of like mediating and conciliating to get uh, some form of goodwill payment uh, to the employee that's affected. So that's another way. Uh, but I, I can't emphasize the more the fact that. Uh, uh, by by fixing an amount, for example, I mean, there are, there are different thoughts. La. Different parts of the world, retention benefits are paid quite differently. Uh, certain parts of the world, there's even a cap at 12 months and 15 months. Uh, I like in, in Singapore, at the tripartite level, there's a guidelines that says it's capped at 25 months uh, or 25 years of service. Uh, but in some other jurisdictions, there are actually lesser cap, lesser payment amounts and some uh, are quite, quite low amounts, actually. So, so therefore, there's uh, no one size fits all. So this is something that uh, I think at the tripartite level, we are always in constant uh, discussions and negotiating and see what's the best way moving forward. Uh, mm. But I, I do agree 
that uh, some form of retrenchment pay payment, uh, if mandated, will be useful. Uh, essentially, if you look at the, the, the raison d'etre of a retrenchment payment or retrenchment benefit, it's basically to tag the worker through the period of time before he gets or, or gets into another job or a new job. I think that's the, the key uh, objective and of course, in a way to compensate him for many years of service in the company. So these two prongs are sort of uh, the, the, the raison d'etre of uh, retrenchment benefits. Essentially, to tag him or her through this difficult period until he or she lands or re-enters the workforce back again. I I have a uh, something to say and jump in and uh, contribute from a slightly different angle. All right, I agree wholeheartedly that uh, perhaps some form of retrenchment or severance package uh, will be meaningful in any employment contract. Uh, where I am not so sure is whether if that becomes a, a legislative minimum whether that is the best idea. Because uh, think of it this way, a retrenchment benefit or severance package becomes an additional cost, uh, whether it's going to be paid to the employee now or later, it will cause the employer to just add that to the hiring costs and e eventually the flexibility of our labor market. So I think there is a bigger picture at play all right, but I want to speak a message to the people who are hurting right now. Look, I know it's going through a very, very difficult time. And I know that, uh, you know, you, you, you listening here, you'll be saying, look, I need to worry about my next rental payment or next, uh, you know, putting milk powder on the table, you know, rather than listening to you all uh, kind of, you know, giving these nice sounding sermons, you know, on a I think there is a message here that I, I would like you all to take away. Rather than debating whether retrenchment benefits should be entrenched, consider this, your career agility. In other words, as an employee, when you signed on to your contract, you willingly signed on that dotted line. And if you accepted no severance package and only one month notice of termination, that was a contract that you undertook. I then ask you, why did you undertake a contract of that kind? And I offer you two possible reasons. Either you felt that you couldn't qualify for anything better, which is something that you have to do some soul searching about, all right, as to why you may hold that view, or you may have felt that perhaps the market is like that and I can't get any better deal. But if you really think about it, this is at the heart and core. It's a mindset issue. It is a question of whether you are engaged in your own career development as an individual and as a person. And that's where the relevance of all this skill, future, upskilling, and all this talk then comes squarely into play. And the reason why I share this so passionately with you all is because I hear a lot of the disgruntled employees when they come to me they are so discouraged and they say, what's the point? The government talk about upskill this, upskill that, but I don't have my paycheck. I understand at that point of hurt that that's your worldview. Mm -hmm. But if you would just take a step back now and look at it, rather than worrying about retrenchment packages, take the time now to do some soul searching and talk about career agility for yourself because that's within your control. And in the meantime, with this program and the rights that we've shared with you, don't be shy to step forward and, you know, ask, you know, for the benefits, all right, if they are due to you. <clears throat> all right, thanks, Sarita. Then, Thank and, you, Francis. That, that and was, then on uh, this point, uh, which uh, Francis uh, kind of like uh, pet me up to uh, talk about, you know, reskilling and uh, career agility. No, I can't help but say, you know, I, I was just interacting with a group of uh, ASEAN tripartite leaders not too long ago. And they were just sharing that uh, they were quite envious of uh, Singapore. I mean, this was prior to COVID-19 uh, on, on how the various measures to help all of us to stay, uh, what I always call the three R's, uh, ready, relevant, and resilient. Uh, ready the new skills, uh, rele uh, ready the new skills, relevant to the new jobs as well as resilient to the changes. So I think more, more, more apt and more timely than, than now. I think we are fortunate in the sense that uh, uh, a lot of, not, not all countries have this strong support mechanisms in terms of funding, help, 
and monetary support for skills acquisition, skills upgrading and training. So I think we are in a fortunate position. We've been putting a lot of emphasis on that and uh, even more so now. Uh, in fact, some of the programs that you see, not just for the employed, uh, even for the self-employed, uh, do come with even training allowances to help them tight through, sort of like a stipend to tight them through uh, that a time, a period of time when they go through extended uh, periods of training. So I think uh, just as uh, those of you who are, who, are, who are with companies, they have been proactively sending you for training. I think uh, kudos to all those employers and businesses. So if uh, for those who are uh, employers and, and uh, business owners out there tuning in, I hope each and every one of you take a serious look at that. I think particularly in this next normal, uh, very, very essential for you to look at more, more from a strategy and strategic point of view, how to prepare uh, uh, you know, your workforce and your company be, basically to, re to redesign, restructure and to uh, redo the way you used to do things. Uh, to, to, to stay uh, you know, competitive and to be able to pivot and, and to, to ride the wave of change. I think that's very important. And companies and businesses are only as strong as the weakest link. So bring your workers along and, and uh, the, the upskilling agenda is very, very big. And there's a lot of support. In fact, I would say total support. I mean, if you, if you have any problems getting uh, support for training, uh, drop me a line or private message. Uh, will connect you to the, the relevant agency. So likewise to workers out there who are tuning in, same message, uh, I, I can't but help but reiterate what Francis uh, mentioned earlier about career agility. And uh, really, I mean, uh, agility is being able with the in-demand skills and being adept to the new changes because uh, even myself, I'm adapting. I mean, all of us, uh, in the last couple of months, I, I was just sharing that uh, I've used small virtual conferencing and meeting soft, uh, softwares that I've used in my whole entire 25 years of my working career. So you can imagine all of us are learning to pivot and learning uh, a new skill at the same time to be able to navigate all this uh, next normal. So so yeah, I can't but help but uh, reiterate Francis' point. Um, you know, there are a lot of support mechanisms and the ecosystem is there to uh, support each and every one of you affected. I know many of you tuning in, uh, if you look at the topic or the, 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 the title of today's program, I'm sure you may be, uh, quite a majority of you may be affected or it, uh, not just affected because of termination or you may have ended your job prior to COVID-19 or even in the midst of COVID-19 took severe pay cuts or even in the midst of uh, or, or being retrenched or in the midst of going to be retrenched uh, or looking for a new opening. At the same time, also some of you may, may, uh, may be in, in sort of a, a fear and uncertainty because of the outlook of your company and business. I think important that uh, uh, I can't emphasize more, tap on all the various support mechanisms that are available uh, uh, to be able to pivot and to, to adapt to the new normal. I think all of us uh, uh, are trying to do that, uh, whichever profession you're in, whichever sector you're in. I got one more point to add on this. Uh, from my positioning as a lawyer, uh, I can say that the view of the Singapore worker or a Singapore trained individual is very much in demand. If you uh, may be feeling down and discouraged now, uh, I ask you to just kind of take a step back and just review what are your strengths and your opportunities. You might just find that, uh, you know, uh, opportunities and, you know, new horizons may actually be available because the perception of a Singapore worker and a Singapore trained worker is premium uh, in the region and around the world. All right, so uh, I hope that this uh, encourages you all, but I think Sarita, back to you, we have another scenario to do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, actually. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Actually, it's been uh, very encouraging, I think, the, the way that you, know, you, have, uh, you have talked about the different assistance and support measures, right? Other than just the focus on retention benefits, um, Patrick, actually, maybe maybe I, I just want to give you a chance to also kind of plug, uh, give a plug for some of NTUC's measures as well, right? So, for example, the NTUC Learning Hub that we have, the NTUC's Job Security Council. Can you just give us a very quick one minute kind of rundown about these different measures yeah. that help both employees and employers? Yeah, so so the, the, uh, I would divide them into two uh, big pieces. Firstly, the employment facilitation. And the other one is on uh, re, uh, increasing your employability. So I think employment assistance, uh, we all know, uh, is, uh, is there uh, through E2I and Workforce Singapore. Uh, and of course, uh, the National Jobs Bank, what we call now the uh, SG Careers Connect. 
I think there are, there are all these various channels. Uh, we have full-time employability co uh, employment coaches uh, to help you in your journey. So you're not alone. You're never alone. Uh, I think you can sign up by appointment basis to, to get very, very bespoke and personalized assistance and coaching in landing the new job. However, of course, mindset is important because some of these new jobs may be in new sectors and require you to pick up skills that you never imagined you would have you need to pick. Mm -hmm. Uh, but therefore, this change in mindset is important. So keep yourselves, uh, keep your mind open, and uh, be be uh, you know, be open to learning something new and exploring some new areas. Uh, you be you be surprised. Uh, we have testimonies from some of the uh, employees who thought they never knew that they would enter this industry, and when they started it, well, after six months, they they love what they're doing. I mean, they meet new people, uh, they get to mingle with younger people, and they get to meet a very diverse kind of like uh, uh, colleagues. And, uh, and of course, learning new things. I think that keeps people motivated and encouraged. Mm -hmm. So that's the employment facilitation bit. The other one is employability. So I, I mentioned earlier on some of the, the interventions uh, through uh, the, the NTC Learning Hub as well as our various uh, training providers that are uh, uh, nationally accredited and supported, including many of our institutes of higher learning who have gone into the continuing education training space. So uh, it is to help two, two groups of workers. Of course, one where the company is affected by by the, the downturn, and therefore keep them keep them engaged, keep them uh, picking up new skills, so that when the market picks up, they are able to segue back to their jobs and and even be redeployed new jobs uh, when when the market picks up. Uh, all this with absentee payroll and support. And of course, there's another group uh, uh, who are doing it all their own initiative, uh, sort of like a career agility of sorts to pick up some. Uh, in demand skills because all the programs that are supported are generally uh, come with it uh, some level of employability so therefore some of these skills they are endorsed and accredited uh, by skills future singapore and of course uh, by the various tripartite partners with strong funding are uh, usually tied to certain industries where there are jobs in demand mm. so so pick up some of these new skills uh, it may put you in good stead and and the good news is uh, now these skills acquisition uh, 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 also come with training allowances so do check uh, the respective web pages of our uh, example NTC Learning Hub and E2I as well as uh, Skills Future for the various programs uh, with very strong support uh, for 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 some of these uh, training. Uh, a good example would be, like, for example, like the financial sector. I know I know financial sector is uh, still doing relatively a bit better than many of the DB affected sectors, but uh, I've been involved in the Institute of Banking and Finance and the Financial Sector Tripartite Committee. There's a lot of support by MAS, for example, and, and the various uh, uh, you know, tripartite partners in the financial sector to help financial sector staff uh, to, to ride the wave of change and to pick up some of these digital skills. Um, they, are, they are particularly relevant. You know, I, 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 I'm, I say this uh, not to sell any koyo, but uh, but essentially because I, I was also a beneficiary. In fact, last year, late last year, because of the growth of fintech, I went to do a Skills Future fintech program to get an idea. Uh, it's supported by Skills Future and of course uh, uh, organized with support from IBF and MES uh, by the Singapore Fintech Association and pick up fintech skills uh, to to know what uh, essentially fintech is about and the capabilities. And mind you, it was a real eye opener for me. For those three days that I was immersed with uh, uh, fellow course participants, uh, getting to know a better idea of the capabilities and the new space that we are in. So like I said, uh, I've been through it and I think it's extremely useful. Uh, it doesn't mean that you need to be out of a job before you need to pick up the new skill or to, to learn something new. And it now extends even to uh, those who are in freelance and self-employed arrangements. So, to, so the training allowance likewise also is extended to them because uh, in Singapore, we have something like 200,000 uh, workers who are, in, uh, who are freelance and self-employed. So actually, uh, these schemes are not just for workers who are in employment or out of job, but also for those who are self-employed or freelance. You can actually tap on some of these uh, training support as well. Thank you, Patrick. Why don't we just move on then to, uh, I think we're short of time, so I, I also want to get to the Q&A section. So why don't we just move on to our next scenario about the employer so in this case, um, you know, it's a simulation from an employer's perspective. So Tina owns a couple of cafes serving coffee and cakes. One is located in the CBD. The other cafe is located in the Heartland Mall. She employs two staff at each location to help with the operations. Her cafes only recently reopened during phase two. The CBD cafe, unfortunately, is still at only 40% capacity due to most CBD workers still working from home. 
uh, and due to the safe distancing restrictions for F&B establishments. The business at the Heartland Cafe, however, has picked up due to more traffic and people you know, starting to move around after the lockdown period, right? Um, when she was doing her business finances recently, she realized that she cannot anymore sustain four employees at full-time pay. She might have to let go of one of her staff to continue keeping all her other three employees at full pay. So in this scenario, what are, what are her options, Patrick and Francis? If she needs to let go of actually one employee at the end of the day, she has no other choice. Then what are the considerations that she has to bear in mind before she makes a decision about who she wants to let go? Yeah, I think in such scenario, I mean, before Francis goes into the legalities on <laughs> what uh, they he can or cannot do, I, I thought, I mean, my first instance when I, I saw this scenario was that, you know, uh, to advise his employer to look at the various schemes, mm. as I've alluded to earlier. I think uh, it's very clear in the tripartite advisory of managing access manpower responsible retrenchment. There's a there's a step by step guide to to say these are the various measures. I think in such instances, uh, it could be as I alluded to, tapping on training, for example, because uh, you never know. Uh, this safe distancing and restrictions may not be permanent. Uh, it could be just for this period of time. Uh, things may get better, and you can as you can see for the last three and four months, things are getting better uh, and gradually opening up and getting lesser restrictions. So that's one. Uh, looking at how to maximize some of these government schemes. And mind you, that's over and above. Uh, the training support is over and above the job support scheme, uh, which is valid till uh, end of August. And of course, uh, there's, uh, the scheme is further extended now uh, till next year, just announced not too long ago. So I think that will help in terms of uh, manpower cost and uh, defray some of the costs uh, involved. So job support scheme is uh, level one. Level two, of course, the training schemes. Uh, level three, of course, uh, we, we have heard about it, as I shared earlier, uh, going on, using up leave, uh, going on no pay leave and taking a second job in the meantime, and then when business picks up, rehire the person or recontinue back, uh, sort of like a furlough arrangement. Or, uh, for example, uh, if there's a need, uh, because we have a flexible wage system in Singapore, if they need to do a wage cut, yeah, uh, perhaps, you know, probably proper consultation and discussion with the employee team uh, to, do, to, to, to do something that's amenable and acceptable. Because I think uh, uh, if you can, it's, a, it's only a small workforce uh, of about four employees. So, so uh, depending on how uh, the fellow employees want to look out for each other, they may have very good camaraderie, for example. I think they also don't want to see one person dropping out of the whole, whole company. I think they will. I, I have instances where, you know, I, I know there's a very collegiate team some of these SMEs that actually come band together and tell the boss, you know, uh, can we just work out some amenable arrangement? We don't mind everybody take a small, we, we chip in. Uh, instead of having to let go of this couple of staff, why don't we chip in and then share the load? I think that's that's some of the, the way, the rules of engagement we have done in, in some instances as well, including with the large companies. So how we share the load. And of course, you have heard some new concepts uh, they have started. Uh, uh, firstly, uh, time banking. Uh, sort of like, you know, hold back. Okay, never mind. You, you, you sort of like a no pay leave arrangements. We save your time next time when you, you work extra, a bit more harder for us. But of course, that one, uh, you need to navigate it carefully. Otherwise, uh, you might break some employment rules. So so these are but some of the measures I thought uh, I would have advised, uh, uh, you know, this this person, this employer uh, before going to the, mm -hmm. the legalities of uh, really. Of course, uh, I'll leave Francis to tell the hard truth. Like, if all else fails and you have done everything that you could, and uh, it's really, you're already at the edge of the cliff and you have to make a binary decision, then Francis, out to you. Mm. Okay, maybe thanks. Francis, before you, uh, sorry, before you pop in. You yeah. yeah, sorry, 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 Francis. Maybe before you uh, go ahead and talk about, you know, the, the, the legal aspects, right? I just also have a follow-on question for this. Like, uh, like what Patrick was saying, if there's no other choice that she has, right? She's tried all these different measures. Um, and, and at the end of the day, there is really no other option that she has left. She has to let go of someone, right? Um, you know, I think going back to the previous discussion that we had in the previous scenario, it, would, would, would she be safe just doing a termination by notice in this case? Or, or would this be considered a, a kind of a retrenchment scenario, right? Because assuming that her business is not expected to pick up anytime soon, then she's just going to leave that particular um, headcount, you know, uh, just 
just not replaced, right, for a certain period of time as well. So does this mean then going back to your previous uh, point where you clarified what, what retrenchment means, um, you know, uh, does this mean then that she has to pay, if, if it's considered a retrenchment, would she have to pay retrenchment benefits as well? Okay, thanks. That's all great questions. Uh, you know, I, I think pre-COVID, it was easier to be a lawyer doing employment law uh, because right now, uh, you know, it, it used to be black and white, you know, uh, but now it is shades of grey. So let me try in this uh, short time to try and give you some of those shades of grey. Okay, Sarita, I start with your question first. Assuming all else fails, and she has to let go of the staff, and she is not planning to replace the staff anytime soon, then under the guidelines, there will be a presumption that this is a redundancy situation, and it is likely to trigger the you know, uh, fair practices about uh, retrenchment benefits and the like. Okay, so that is uh, you know, to answer that question head on. But then again, you see, it's not so binary to, to mm -hmm. use that lovely word that Patrick uh, uh, gave just now. I think the situation is a little bit more nuanced and I'm mindful that our scenario here seems to talk about an employer in a small business setup. I would like to expand our discussion and give some food for thought, which will be applicable to a small business setup as well as the large business setup whether it's an MNC or a larger corporation, all right? And let's think of it this way. The scenario actually leads you to this, where she looks at the financials and she says, oh no, all right? For my business survivability, I may have to let go of staff, all right? And this goes back to what uh, Patrick was saying earlier, that nice little uh, word that he used. You know, you are cutting costs to save jobs or are you cutting jobs, you know, uh, you know, in order to save costs? You know, it is that kind of a thing. And it would appear now that actually she need not just go into this cut off an, uh, an employee in order to basically save my business. All right. So let's go through the rationales. There are three thought processes. The first is why even bother to consider your staff and whether retrenchment benefits should be paid? Shouldn't the needs of my business come first? All right. And I want to leave one thought there for this header. If you do not show care to your staff at this stage, you may have a whole lot of other unforeseen circumstances for your business. Morale issues of the staff that remain they may be thinking, this one's gone now. What about me? When is my mm. turn coming? Reputational issues. If, you, if the market finds out that you're a crummy employer, next time when business is good and uh, you know, uh, people are fighting for staff because it's a tight market situation, people may not have you in a, as an employer of choice. Mm. Plus, in these days uh, where people talk about reputation and doing the right thing, your customers and other stakeholders may not find your you know, behavior palatable. And you may have all these other battles that you are facing. All right, so that de deals with some of the broad why as an employer, you should be considering fair retrenchment and responsible retrenchment practices. Then the question is the next, the how. Uh, adding on to what Patrick was saying, all right, we've got some scenarios here. Heartland CBD. You've got staff that obviously are trained and know their job. Is it possible to redeploy your staff from the CBD, which is non-performing, over to the heartland where business may be good? Mm. All right. Consider the collegiality of your team. If these are staff that are bonded and gelled together, they may accept perhaps wage cuts in order to save their friend's job and you know tighten the belts uh, for a future a uh, time where business picks up and they can all enjoy the fruits as well. Then, of course, you talk about training, all right? You talk about then uh, adjusting your business, scaling up, scaling down. These are all the commercial aspects of the how-to, all right? Then, at the end of it, 
if push come to shove and your business is really going to collapse if you don't lay off that one staff after you've done all of these other things, then the question is in what I call do it in a caring way. All right. I think the staff will understand if a business owner takes ownership of the scenario and explains to them why certain hard measures need to be done. If the staff understand that you care and that you are giving transparency and detail, I think nobody in their right mind is going to say, you cannot wind up your company, you must employ me for life. All right, people will understand provided you take ownership. And then the second aspect is communication. It is not just the way you communicate this to the staff that you're laying off, but to the staff that you're retaining. All right, so whether you're a small setup or a big setup, the why, how, and do it in a caring way are relevant, especially in times like this. All right, now I know everyone is talking about gloom and doom about how COVID has adjusted the world forever, but think of it, the people will remain, the demand for your uh, services will remain, you are still going to have to service customers in the long run. How are you going to do that? Retrenchment is just a speed bump. You need to consider how you are going to face this scenario for the long term. And your staff are an integral part of it because they are the ones that are customer facing. They are the ones that are going to deliver the product uh, you know, in the manufacturing line. You cannot work without your staff. All right. So that's why retrenchment and fair retrenchment practices, I would say, are uh, not an optional thing for any employer. You have to seriously look at it now and you have to implement it in the right way. Right? Back to you, Sarita. Mm. Yeah, if, if, it, if I may just also add in that, uh, you know, it's... Uh, I, I've seen so many retrenchments. I mean, uh, my 18 years in the labour movement, I, I, I've seen some retrenchments uh, that were, were done very fairly, responsibly, in a caring manner. Uh, and and you'd be surprised. Uh, it does not live with a bad aftertaste. In fact, uh, I, I've seen retrenchments where employees actually banded together and they were so closely knitted and uh, sort of applauding, uh, you know, uh, left the company in a very uh, in on a high note. So we, we have we I've personally seen instances uh, like this. And uh, if I may just give a few tips to employers out there, besides the fair retrenchment framework, which the labor movement has been lobbying for, uh, essentially, uh, as what mentioned by Francis earlier, communicate. Uh, in this day and age, please over communicate, uh, never under communicate. I think uh, uh, many of this information, you'd be surprised, uh, it goes out very, very quickly. So I think over communicate, uh, get employees, uh, aware of what's uh, available, ava not just those affected, but all employees, bring them up to speed on how the company has been doing in the past many months, how the company is doing now, and what's the forecast like in the next months ahead. So when people are aware, when, when communication is open and transparent, and that's when they start to be more considerate and uh, they, can, they, they are more empathetic of what's happening uh, to the company and the businesses and to the bosses as well. So, so I can't help but say, you know, uh, please over communicate. Uh, and, and, and of course, be considerate because uh, any kind of move, whether it's pay cut, wage cuts, uh, overtime cuts, uh, what have you, uh, even layoffs are, are, are very sensitive, uh, very emotional uh, encounters. So, so uh, and livelihoods are at stake, lives at home are at stake. So, so do it in a very sensitive, uh, in a responsible and fair manner. I think that, that's, uh, that, that's key. Um, just as treat others just like how you want to be treated, particularly in such a time and age. Yeah. Mm. Excellent, Patrick and Francis. Maybe let's move on then to the Q and A section. Um, so there have been a, a whole bunch of uh, questions that that have come in, including you know when when some of our attendees first registered to attend this webinar. Um, I just want to maybe divide them according to different kind of buckets, right? So one of the major buckets and even the questions that are coming in right now, um, you know, relates really to the issue that we discussed previously for the scenario for the employee about uh, disguised retrenchments, right? Um, a couple, uh, you know, the, this, this bucket of questions basically relate to the point where, you know, employees or workers just feel aggrieved, you know, um, 
that their employment has been terminated. And, and, uh, and the two sub points are basically whether or not, you know, they feel that it's a disguised retrenchment or number two, you know, the, the fact that, you know, they might feel aggrieved or, or the fact, or, or perhaps, you know, that it's considered from their perspective to be wrongful dismissal, right? Or unfair termination uh, versus, you know, even though it's just done by a termination by notice, you know, uh, maybe Francis as, as, a, as a, you know, as the lawyer or on this, uh, on this uh, or rather as a legal advisor for this uh, particular discussion, can you give us a flavor of, of, you know, how can people tell what is a unfair, um, unfair termination or wrongful dismissal? Is there, is there some kind of guidance that, that we have uh, in the law that, that gives a certain criteria so that employees can make that assessment? And, mm. and, then, and then a follow-up point to this is who then can they go to, right, to, to file this complaint? I know, um, Patrick and yourself, you have mentioned about, um, you know, about MOM, right, or, or TADEM that you can go to. Can you just give us a flavor of what kind of evidence they have to bring to this particular kind of uh, tribunals? to make their case? Okay. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> let's see. Loaded questions. Let's see how to do this in an organized way. Okay. This is the way we'll do it. Imagine then that we have a scenario of uh, an employee that has been terminated uh, pursuant to the contract, uh, paid off the one month's, uh, you know, uh, pay in lieu of notice, told to leave on the very same day. Uh, this employee then feels aggrieved, suspects that, hey, why am I being targeted? Performance is good. Uh, and, uh, you know, why am I being asked to leave? And no retrenchment benefits. Okay. So typically, this kind of an employee, uh, we would be asking them these things. We'll say, look, your contract provided for termination with one month's notice. You have been terminated in accordance with your contract, all right? But you feel that it's unfair. So if you are alleging that you've been targeted, if you're discriminated, or for example, if it's a performance issue, do you have available your performance reviews of the past few years? Uh, you know, is there anybody in the company that's prepared to come forward and say that actually your performance is really good? Why are you being terminated? All right. Then, of course, there will be the question of, is there going to be a replacement for your role? Because if there is going to be no replacement in the near future, then there is, of course, in the current uh, climate, presumed retrenchment. So what this employee would then be uh, advised to do is cost uh, efficiency, go to the MOM website, all right, get some guidance, and then take note of that one month for the TADM filing, go to the TADM and get the guidance. TADM will then ask you to produce evidence of your grievance exactly along the lines as I just mentioned. All right. So in a sense, you would then have to be able to prove why you think, despite being terminated in accordance with your contract, that there's some element of unfairness uh, involved in your case, all right? And of course, that presumption of a retrenchment, if you feel that you've been let go due to redundancy, they're not going to replace you and they're just trying to get out of, uh, you know, paying the retrenchment benefits. That is a good starting point to go for. All right, Patrick, you have any uh, little gems that you want to add from your experiences on the ground? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add because I was just looking through the chat and the list of questions. And I thought, you know, in the, in the interest of time, try to cover and try to answer as many as I could. Uh, mm -hmm. Having a quick perusal of questions. I think there, there was one question coming in on whether uh, retention benefits is, old, uh, is in addition or is subsumed within the notice pay. So take note, uh, it's separate. Mm -hmm. uh, so notice pay is notice pay. Sorry, new, uh, uh, notice pay is uh, one component. Retention benefits will be over and above uh, the notice pay. So these are separate items. So they are not lumped together. Uh, then there was another question on uh, how long do you need to serve in a company before you are entitled to retrenchment benefits? Of course, it's a provision in the Employment Act. Uh, take note, uh, uh, the retrenchment benefit provision is subsumed within Part 4. I mean, it's a bit of a legal thing, but uh, otherwise, uh, it may be only a certain group of employees. Uh, likewise, also for collective agreements. 
Uh, but uh, in, in all instances, uh, usually uh, it's provide, provided explicitly in the Employment Act. The as long as a, well, it's a negative eligibility clause, quite poorly drafted, I mean, if I may say it. Uh, but otherwise, if you have at least two years of service, uh, you may be paid with treasure benefit if you have at least two years of service. It used to be three, but uh, we had done one round of amendments and uh, it's been reduced to two because of uh, you know the shorter cycles of employment these days. But otherwise, that does not preclude you from some sort of severance payments. It's already provided a contract. Likewise, in the unionized environment uh, for employees less than two years, usually we would try to negotiate for sort of like a goodwill payment, uh, essentially to tie the worker through the difficult period when uh, he or she is uh, laid off. So that covers, I think, two or three of the questions. Mm. Yeah, Patrick, maybe there's one other question that I, I thought was quite interesting. This also comes from the perspective, it seems like, of an employer. Um, you know, the question is, is it appropriate to take, to take into account performance in deciding who to be made redundant? Do we as employers also share this with employees by being upfront and transparent? Or is it in the best interest of the employer not to reveal too much? I think that the key thing is when you carry out I mean, retrenchment is prerogative uh, of uh, the employer. In Singapore, I mean, that's uh, retrenchment is in the prerogative of the employer. I think the key thing now is uh, whether he or she is paid the retrenchment benefit. So I think that's in the retrenchment exercise, that's always the key consideration. Maybe even when unions negotiate, we negotiate about retrenchment benefit. But in the choice of who to retrench, I think that's... Uh, so so in, in a way, uh, like what Francis mentions, not so binary these days. No? Things are getting different shades of grey in that sense. So in the choice of uh, who to lay off, for example, I mean, I, I, I've, I've seen cases where uh, the, the company prejudices against, for example, the older workers. Mm. Yeah, the older workers. Uh, either maybe they are already past retirement age, for example, so they don't really employ them and then they, 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 they remove this group of workers first. So that's where uh, in, in, in unionized environments, you usually pay a bit more close attention in the choice uh, of the employees. Uh, I mean, we are particularly sensitive and sensitized to the fact that sometimes, for example, uh, older workers or the not so young workers in the workforce or pregnant employees, for example. So, so I think in the choice of, uh, of, of uh, who to be laid off, first, of course, we see whether that, that, that job function is essentially the one that is being made redundant. I look at the job function. So if let's say you, you stop certain product line or that product is, has, has become obsolete because of COVID-19 and therefore we close the entire uh, chain of business or that, that particular business unit, then uh, whoever he or she is in that, uh, well, if it's genuinely like that, then uh, that whole department is redundant and therefore uh, it carries out the retrenchment. However, it's a situation where uh, it's that product line closed, but why you start retrenching people from other departments? But actually, that's not the department that's, uh, or that's made as an excuse. Then I, I would, I would like to put a few question marks on that, and and therefore, uh, if it's a unionized environment, usually uh, we will we will dive a bit deeper, and also find the the real reason why uh, when you your actually your main business factor is A, but why are you retrenching or laying off people from B, C, D, E, which are actually doing fairly well, and in fact, very profitable. Thank, thank you, Patrick. Maybe um, a related actually question, not really related, but perhaps from the, you know, the, as an MP yourself, as a labor movement a leader as well. I think there's another question here about, you know, um, can a company close down, terminate the staff and reopen as a new company the following month and recruit staff at lower pay? Does the government monitor such activities and how do we prevent this? Uh, okay, I mean, there, there, there is actually, well, I can let Francis go into the, you know, the whole idea of company law and separate legal entity and what have you. But otherwise, uh, on 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 face value, prima facie, I think uh, uh, when, whenever uh, companies close down, I mean, we have seen the likes of some companies. I mean, not because of terminating staff, but even for other instances to escape debts and stuff like that. So I mean, uh, we 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 have, we have seen uh, executive measures being uh, rolled out, even legal. Uh, sanctions against such companies. If if genuinely they are they are doing it, uh, you know, in in a fraudulent matter or in, even in a dishonest manner. So definitely, uh, if, if such a case is reported, uh, do they we, we do uh, you know put on extra scrutiny on them, and they need to take executive measures uh, against them. Uh, so that's my 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 quick reply to this. Uh, so 
uh, whether it's any any company, I think uh, whether if they're doing it in, in, a, in a very uh, in a fraudulent or malpractice way, then uh, definitely if there's a complaint that arises or there's a whistle blowing and the investigations reveal as such and there's sufficient evidence, then uh, definitely there may be executive measures taken against them. Mm. You know, let me just jump in here quickly. Uh, listening to the two questions, uh, I think uh, perhaps this would be a thinking map that uh, employees and, employ uh, and employers can use. From the employer point of view, it is always your prerogative to run your business. And your business has to be a profitable business. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense for you to be a businessman or in, in, in the business anyway. The issue is not about whether you can or cannot do anything. I think the issue here in this crisis situation is how you do it. All right, because you are really talking in terms of you are looking at your company business and your company bottom line. And if you do come to the conclusion that in order to save your business, after having done all of the other alternative measures and retraining, redeployment, whatever, and you still have, say, no choice. To save the company, we need to take some hard measures. Then the question that arises would be, how do you communicate this to your staff and are you doing it fair by them? If you have money in the company, then I think the fair uh, guidelines, uh, the tripartite good practice guidelines require you to consider making best effort to pay retrenchment benefits. If you feel that you have to favor this group of staff because of their productivity and performance, which outshines the other one, then let go the non-performing or lesser performing staff in a humane way. There is no need to go out there you know, and just take the knife or the axe and just cut through everybody and drop them. And to that question about whether or not you can take advantage of legality and company law to just close down and reset up and rehire, let me ask you the question. If you do that, realistically as an employer, which right-thinking employee is going to trust you and join you in the future? Okay, unless the employees are all in the scheme together, in which case then we don't need to have this discussion because they're all doing it together. All right, but the presupposition here is that the employer is treating the staff unfairly, closing to avoid obligations and then setting up shop and saying, I'm hiring again. If you've been cheated once as an employee, why are you going to join the same guy again? All right. And from the employee point of view, I know a lot of you are feeling helpless, you know, dragged along by circumstances. But then I encourage you to go back to what Patrick and I were talking about earlier about career agility. You know, sometimes it boggles my mind. I've had clients come and I ask them, when was the last time you signed your contract? My, oh, my contract signed 10 years ago. And you've been in this job, same job description, same pay with small increments for the last 10 years. And then you sit down and wonder why in a crisis situation, you're one of the first to go. All right. My question to that employee, okay, and I've said this to some of my clients, what have you been doing in the last 10 years to upgrade yourselves and remain relevant to the company? And usually the answer is, uh, don't know. All right. And therein lies your answer. So you may be facing hard times now, but use this as a chance to reassess your career agility. All right. And as Patrick said, there are all the help schemes out there. This is probably the best time to get retrained or to reskill and retool. All right. I know the pain is there. I know the uncertainty to your families is there. All right. But at the same time, you owe it to yourself to take charge okay, of your own career development and advancement. And so from the employee point of view, this is the best time to engage with your employers and say, look, I know you're going through a rough time. How can we do this together so that I come out of it with you still in your employment, but stronger? All right. And I know in an Asian context, uh, we are not used to talking and having this kind of dialogue with our uh, employers or superiors. But I think this is probably the best time to start. Right. Thank so, you, Francis. Thanks, Arita. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. no, Thank you, Francis. You. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Patrick, I think, for your uh, fantastic actually responses um, you know, to, to the questions. And uh, unfortunately, we, we are running short of time, so I have to bring our Q&A session to a close. Uh, to the audience members, please remember to download the useful 
useful materials regarding the issues discussed today. Again, they will be found in your handouts pane on your screen. Uh, before we go, why don't I, I just want to maybe quickly summarize, you know, the, the key discussion points and the key message, you know, from, from our, both our wonderful speakers actually this evening. So um, the key point that I've taken note of is basically the common theme really is that in this challenging and difficult situation, uh, both employers and employees must have regular, open, transparent and honest communication to weather the storm that's hitting all of us. For workers or employees, we need to be prepared to make tough choices when it comes to helping employers reduce manpower costs and also be ready to upskill and get training assistance to adapt to the changing environment. For employers, on the other hand, uh, we need to do our part to be fair, responsible and progressive in dealing with employment and livelihood matters. Mm. Um, I think as a parting, maybe as a, as a parting remark is, uh, you know, please seek out assistance, whether you're an employee or employer, if you need it. The point is we are all in this together and we should all be ready to help each other get out of this together as well. Um, separately, on, on, uh, on another note, for more information about the COVID-19 laws and how to navigate them, please visit COV8 at www.nus-cov8.com. The QR link uh, will be found on, will be find, you can find your QR link on your screen. This is a website created by a group of NUS law students who saw the need to support the community during these difficult times. With that, uh, we have to come to the end of our webinar. I hope that you found our webinar on employment, termination and retrenchment useful. Your feedback is important to us. It will help us make future webinars more relevant and useful to you. Once you leave today's webinar, you will find a survey. We would appreciate your feedback on this survey for today's session. On behalf of the Law Society Pro Bono Services, thank you very much, Patrick, Francis, all our attendees for spending your evening with us. Have a good night. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Good night.